Well, good morning. Um, I, I know that uh, we'll probably be a little small to start. People will trickle in. Uh, they're running a little behind. Um, this will be our shortest weekend of the year. Um, I still haven't figured out how the day gets longer by borrowing an hour from the fall, but I'm sure smarter people than I have figured that out, and that's why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, to get us started, um, if you don't know, I've been here since October-ish of 2018, so just over a year now, and um, I know some people and some things, but who's been at South Yukon for more than 10 years? Okay, how about more than 20 years? Okay, um, anybody more than 30? Wow, okay, so here's my question to you guys, because I, I don't know. What, if you go back 30 years, What's different today about the church here than 30 years ago? It wasn't here. Okay, so where was it? On Cornwell. Across from Grand... Oh! So down that way, around where the... Where the um, uh, Shop and sit. No, Super Saber is. It was the Taco Bell Church of Christ. That was probably convenient for. And and thirty years ago, you could go there and buy like a ten or twenty pack of tacos, so it was very convenient for potluck. Um, what else is different besides the location, size? What was the size like thirty years ago? Two, three hundred? What were you going to say? You didn't have caution tape back then. I know. Man. But I'm so glad that it worked. I was afraid it wouldn't be obvious what I was trying to do. So <laughs> that worked really well. So what else is different? Anything? The ministers changed. Okay. I'm sure the elders have changed. The deacons have changed. What else is different? Technology. You don't mean to say that you sang out of books. Wow. You sang out of books, okay. Still had pews, though. Yeah. Oh, the number boards that told the... Oh, I loved those. Except every once in a while, they'd get the number transposed. <laughs> And so half would be on one page and half would be on another, yeah? What else is different? What significant differences have you seen? Because there's got to be some other differences. There's more. You're all older, okay. Yeah. What else has changed from, from, from 20 or 30 years ago? Grace? Okay. Okay. So 20, 30 years ago, there was a stronger emphasis on do this, don't do that, or else. And now there's a stronger emphasis on love and grace. Okay. What other changes? Anything? Um, we're not ashamed of the kitchen anymore. Okay, yeah, there, there's definitely been groups that kitchens are a problem and, and fellowships are a problem. And um, I, I bet it's also not a problem to bring beverages into the auditorium. Yeah, yeah, when I was growing up, you couldn't do that. That was crazy. What were you thinking? This isn't a social hour. Dress, the dress code is different? Oh, what's different about the dress code? There's not one now. <laughs> okay, okay. 
actually, it was, oh, now I'm dating myself. It was probably 20, yeah, about 20 years ago, I was interviewing at a, a church. And they actually had, and there was a room off the, the front of the auditorium. And it was, it was funny because they had a chalkboard with a picture of what, like, the auditorium was drawn on there and numbers for the positions where the men would serve for communion. And it was kind of like our little playbook. We gather together and, okay, you're going to go down this side and this side, and you block here. And, but they had a rack of jackets and ties because you couldn't serve up front in any capacity without a jacket and tie. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it is different. My, my daughter was, I mean, she almost fainted the day I came in, and, and I had on a button-down shirt, but I had jeans. Most churches didn't have youth ministers back then. The parents did it. That is very true. Um, any other changes that jumped out at you? Home group. Yeah, that wasn't a thing. You came to the building. Doors opened, you came here. And that's what you were expected. So there's been some changes. And so I, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. And not all changes, change is not necessarily good or bad in and of itself. It's what changes that becomes what matters. And so we are starting a 13-week series, and Perry kicked all of the groups off last week with a great introduction on, on Ephesus and kind of the course that we're going to be studying. But today, I'm going to kind of look at the front and back of Ephesus. We're going to look at the church in the beginning as it started in Acts. And then we're going to skip ahead about 30 years or so and look at what Jesus says in John's last letter of the Bible, the, the letter of Revelation, what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, and talk about those changes. And then maybe we'll have time to come back into the middle and talk a little bit about how South Yukon is similar or dissimilar to the church in Ephesus. So before we do that, if you'll bow with me, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be here today. Father, to, to open up your word, to read, to study. Father, it is a privilege for all of us to be able to know you, your plan, and your will. God, I pray that you would help me to remember the things that I've studied, that you would be with all of us, that we might grow and learn together as we strive to be more like you, more like the church you design. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so I, I want to take a couple of minutes and kind of give you a little bit of a walkthrough of, of what some of that history is so that we can then kind of talk about it. And my goal is not to talk as much. You guys are going to have to do some talking because you don't want me to stand here and just talk for 45 minutes. Nobody will get as much out of that as if we all kind of share our comments and thoughts. So keep that in the back of your mind. The first question I'm going to ask, by the way, I'll give you a, a warning, is how would you describe the church at Ephesus? So keep that in the back of your mind. In fact, there's the question. So. We first read about Ephesus in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, where Paul is actually forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go preach to the churches in Asia. And Ephesus is kind of this gateway location into Asia. It's located just on the uh, eastern coast of Turkey. Uh, it, it's a port city, actually a little inland, but there's a road there to the port. And, and so that was, it was a big deal. It was a trade route. Lots of traffic went back and forth through Ephesus. In Acts 18, uh, about the end of his second missionary journey, in verses 19 to 21, 
he arrives in Ephesus, but doesn't stay. He leaves Priscilla and Aquila there um, and says, hopefully, God will let him come back. And he, he departs. Then it's the beginning of his third missionary journey, and he comes to Ephesus. We see the, the beginning of this in Acts chapter 19. And 19 is going to be our biggest uh, starting point for what we learn about the church in Ephesus. And so in Acts 19, Paul comes and he spends three months teaching in the synagogue every day, persuading and telling people about Jesus. And then some people that are, Acts refers to them as stubborn uh, or hard-hearted, kind of run him out of the synagogue, so he goes to the hall of Pyrrhus. And there he preaches and teaches daily for, over, for, for two years, the text says. So he's actually in the city of Ephesus for two to three years. And we get half a chapter or so of what he specifically said. And so sometimes we kind of gloss over how long he's in some place because we look at the number of verses that are tied to it rather than what the text tells us the actual time was. So that's important to keep in the back of our minds. And so then, after spending between two and three years in Ephesus, he goes on on his journey, his third missionary journey, and he's trying to, at the end of his third journey, get back to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. He's going to go back to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem he's going to end up in Rome through a, through a journey of its own. But on his way back, he can't afford to stop in Ephesus. And so he calls the elders from Ephesus to Miletus and, and talks to them, gives them a charge, prays for them and with them, and then heads out from Ephesus to head towards Jerusalem. And so we have that last section of teaching there in Acts chapter 20, verses 16 to 38. We have what Paul said to the elders there at the church in Ephesus. Now we know that at some point, Timothy gets sent to Ephesus, and Timothy's there. In fact, 1 Timothy specifically says, while you're in Ephesus. And so Paul's talking to Timothy while he's in Ephesus. And then we flash forward, see, um, Ephesians was written probably the early 60s, as most people's guess, what the evidence suggests. Um, and, and Acts ended around the... Details of the book of Acts end right around the late 50s. And so we get this picture of what's going on there in the church of Ephesus, but then Revelation's not written until the, the mid to late 90s, most would say. And so John writes a, a, a book based on his vision, and in that book, Jesus mentions the church in Ephesus. He tells them to the church in Ephesus, and he shares this little letter with them. And I, I actually want to read that section to you uh, in Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your work, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so that's, that's the final text we have relating to the church in Ephesus. And so let's go back to the beginning. Twice, Paul can't get into Asia to preach. He's, he's kept. There's something holding him back in his spirit that says, I can't go. This is not the right timing. And we get to Acts chapter 19, and Paul shows up. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. So tell me, how would you describe the church at Ephesus there in the first few years while Paul's there? What do you find? Thoughts? Pretty good shape. Okay. I mean, first of all, Paul arrives to a new city and there's already disciples there. So absolutely. What else? I know you're, you're thumbing through chapter 19. That's okay. I did that too. Okay. Being in a city that had so many gods, they hadn't turned against the true God. And so, so absolutely, he was able to teach in the Hall of Tyrannus for, for two years. So we know that there's this public location of teaching, and he's there. But culturally, it was good to note that usually that middle part of the day, people took a rest break. It was the heat of the day. They didn't work out. That was their break. They started really early when the sun came up. They ended until the sun went down, but that middle top heat of the day, they took a nap or went and listened to a teacher, had lunch, did something like that. They were clean slate. Yeah, and in fact, there are some places where it looks like some of the teachers there didn't understand. If you recall, Apollos comes through and starts teaching in Ephesus, and Priscilla and Aquila take him aside because he was powerful in the Scriptures, but apparently he was not quite understanding everything he was supposed to understand. And so Priscilla and Aquila take him aside. They don't do it publicly in front of the church. They take him aside and say, hey, we should talk. And they study with him and help him have a better understanding of the gospel that he's trying to teach. And so we see that. So there is kind of this clean slate. Absolutely. What else? How else would you describe the city of Ephesus? Absolutely. What do you see in his letter that stands out, maybe? He's so complimentary. Absolutely. Talk about a solid church. I mean, Paul spends, before Paul gets there, we know that Apollo spent time there, Priscilla and Aquila were there. Paul gets there and spends over two years teaching daily. So there is, I mean, talk about looking for a strong church. Ephesus would have had that. I imagine they preached and taught as well. In fact, it's interesting. Um, you don't hear in Paul's letters the concept and idea that, hey, by the way, you're a Christian now. You should really be sharing Jesus with your neighbor. He never says that. You ever wonder why? I think it has to do with the fact that everybody, once they became a follower of Jesus, a follower as a uh, Paul will, or Luke will write an act, uh, follower of the way, that they had this idea that, oh, I better share this. This is important. I have no business doing anything but sharing. They didn't have any other option. 
Everybody shared and taught. So absolutely. What else do you see in Ephesus? How else would you describe the church in Ephesus? Okay. Absolutely, we can look at Revelation and say they lost their first love, so obviously there must have been a higher level of passion and love. What that looks like, I'm not sure. We'll get into that. But, but yeah, there was, there was something more there. They didn't just do church. They were there, they were passionate about it. What else? Harry. Yes. They were not a homogenous church. They were mixed culturally and racially. Uh, it was a melting pot. And so there were lots of people that were back and forth and in and around Ephesus. It was, I mean, a port city. It was a, a traveling way into Asia. So they were constantly people coming and going in Ephesus. And we see that melting pot there, especially in his letter to Ephesians. He spends a lot of time talking about both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles and, and Jews. What else do we see? Anything jump out at you? Okay. So, oh, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. You're just taking a drink. I just did that to you. BJ, okay. So, um, BJ pointed out that in Revelation, one of the things it says is that you have abandoned the love you had at first. What do you think that means? What's he talking about? The love you had at first. If you had, huh? They got comfortable, complacent. Okay? What else might that mean? The, hmm? They quit work. Well, we know they were working hard. They hadn't grown weary, so we know they were still working. But you have abandoned the love you had at first. Thought. They were working by road. It was just, it was a habit. This is what we do. We, we, we eat, we feed the poor, we share. It's just what we do. Okay? It's interesting, that word abandoned here in, in Scripture, or uh, some texts would say you have lost the love you had at first. Um, that, that word there is the same word that Mark uses in his discussion, uh, Jesus' discussion of uh, marriage with the Pharisees, about the seven brothers who, who each one died, had, had lost, had forsaken. They, they were not there anymore and didn't leave an heir. And each brother did that. And that's the same word he uses in that story to describe the brothers leaving and being separated from. It. It's this just... I'm gone. That love that was here, nope, not me anymore. So what kind of love do you think he's talking about? If you had to, are you thinking more of a passion for God love, or is it a passion for one another? Okay. Okay. So more a, a, a loss of, of love for one another because as people evolved and they were checking teaching and doctrine and trying to make sure they were right there, that, that compassion and love and tolerance for one another kind of waned. 
Okay? Other ideas or thoughts? Well, he compliments them on their faith, and evidently they lost a lot of that. She's asking, is that true? <sighs> yes and no. When we look at Revelation, we see this idea that they're still being faithful. They're still holding on to Jesus' name. They're still sound in doctrine. They, they dislike, they hate the teaching of the Nicolaitans, probably a, a Gnosticism group. They, they're fleeing that. They're still doing things, but they lost love. And, and perhaps it is that love for one another. Joe. Okay. 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 It if you didn't hear Joe, he he said that it talks about that they they had the doctrine, they knew the right teachings, they called fraudulent teachers frauds. But they, they seem to have lost that first love, that first love of the person who died for them. He, he says, in today's vernacular, we'd say they know the book, they don't know the author. It's, it's things they do. We, right here, they were just going by rote. They were just doing what they were doing because it's what they were supposed to. Very. Okay. Yeah. I read. So Perry talks about that in Ephesians four, Paul says, "Speak the truth in love." By Revelation four, it's obvious. Or Ephesians four. Revelation 2, it's obvious they were still speaking truth, but that love piece is missing. We, we know what that's like. Just because you're right doesn't mean everyone's going to listen if you're not saying the right thing in a way that conveys the care as well. That's important. So, so how many people have been in the church for at least, church as a whole, for at least 10 years. Okay? 20 years. 30 years. 40 years. Dare I say 50 years? And we still have hands. So as a collective group, I would estimate that we have probably at least a thousand years of church experience in this little group right here. So it would make sense that if Ephesus was going to hire a church consultant after receiving the letter they received in, Ephe or in Revelation 2, that they would hire this group. So if you were hired as the church consultant for the church in Ephesus, based on the letter that Paul, that John wrote, that Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, you'd lost your first love. You've got the doctrine. You've got the deeds. You're not lacking in endurance. 
You haven't grown weary. You still stand up for my name, but you've abandoned your first love. You've lost that first love. Whether that's a love to one another, which probably part of it is. They've got the truth. They've abandoned the love. Or it's a a passion and love for God. That relationship with God that they've lost. If they bring you in and say, hey, we got this letter from Jesus and we're not sure, what do we do now? How do we fix this? What would you tell them they need to do? Go back to the beginning. Okay. Love people first. Instead of having God try to do that here and then here. Okay, so so there's an enthusiasm. Uh, When you're first baptized, you're excited, you feel alive, there's something new, and you tell people. But then as you go along, how do we keep that up? Reevaluate. We reevaluate like, um, like go back and check why are we doing this? Are we still doing it the right way and for the right reason? Right. Right. Okay. So if if you didn't hear Perry, he's talking about uh, marriage councils will tell couples that are struggling to maybe go back and do the things they first used to do. Go go to the restaurant you used to go to, uh, do the same activities, do some of the same things in some of the same places to try and remember that that spark. Those fond memories will hopefully spark something new now. And so he talks about that, but he says in the same way. Lots of times, generationally, as church, um, if the first generation has a fire and a passion and a love, the second generation, that fire and passion and love turns into a fierce desire to abide by those rules. And so they don't grow up with the same love. It becomes a, a love of the rules. I've got to do this right, because if I do this right, like my parents did, the problem is they're doing it right because it's the rule. Their parents did it right because they were in love with the person who taught them. 
I, what else? Absolutely. So if you're, if you're working, we tend to look at the result of what we're doing. We want to see the fruit. And if we don't have the fruit, then we start troubleshooting the growing process. Start figuring out what's wrong. What did I do wrong? Where in the process did it break down? Instead of realizing why we were supposed to be producing fruit in the beginning, going back to the source. Other thoughts? Oh. Often we accept or reject the message based on who's delivering it rather than on the content of the message itself. Think about a lot of times we have... Um, in the Church of Christ tradition where I grew up on the East Coast um, and, and where I did ministry in, in the Northeast, um, I heard a lot, we can't do that good deed or good function or good thing because they, some other group that follows Jesus do, but differently than we do doctrinally, do that thing. And we don't want people to think that we are them. Because they are they, and we, we are the church. So sometimes it's not about whether it's true or not, it's about who's giving it to us. Okay, so, so maybe, and, and if you've noticed, Questions seem to be getting harder. But here's a really good question. How is the church at Ephesus similar or dissimilar to here at South Yukon? And you can talk about the early church at Ephesus or the, the Revelation version 30 years later, but what are some of the similarities or dissimilarities you see here? Okay. We're humans, so we have to have the same types of sermons preached to us so we can bring our life into order. Sometimes we allow tradition to override scriptural. I might even add, sometimes we allow rules to, to run things rather than heart and passion. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and so he says, you know, there's love, but one of the things generationally we've done since the very beginning is we somehow lose our fear of God. And there is, it's, it's, it's a weird, weird thing, and, and our words certainly don't do it justice, the idea of this fear and awe and love of, of God, who, to him, this world in, in his hand is just that. Something that's in his hand. It's something he made. And yet, 
on such a grand scale, the universe and the count, I mean, everything we see and know, he designed and created, and he is so much bigger, while at the same time, knowing exactly how many hairs are on my head, which is easier to do today than last year, maybe. Uh, they're vanishing. But he knows that type of intimate detail. What else do you see as similar or dissimilar? Okay. Okay, but talk a little louder. So the sum Okay. So so John says if you didn't hear it, I'll try and sum it up and John will tell me if I'm right. But basically if you go back and look at, at, at the church in, in Acts, uh, the church in Ephesians and Acts, there was this love and there was this passion and they spent time together. I mean Paul was every day teaching in the same place and the believers and followers and disciples they, they we're all together learning and teaching and working and loving one another because they wanted to be together, because they had a passion for one another, passion for the message of God. But as time goes on, that passion, that, that zeal, that, that togetherness slowly transforms into routine and ritual and we kind of lose that, and he goes on to say, and then the elders here see that, and the vision and the idea of being one in purpose and in mind is some of that togetherness, that unity that he's hoping draws in. You know, one of the things that, that I see <coughs> is this idea that when I, I look back, at Scripture, and, and I look at it, one of the things I always try to do is pull it back to what's going on here. How does that relate to my church here? And I think part of what we are hoping, um, and we being all the different teams and groups that are teaching, is that our study of the church in Ephesus, we can look at a church that started with a passion and a zeal that had so much going for it, but somehow that passion, that initial first love, that, that energy, that love for one another, that love for serving God kind of waned into, I mean, I remember when I was dating my wife, then we were engaged, and just being near her, my pulse went up. I don't know that my pulse goes up every time we see each other. But I think the same thing happens with me and God. When I was first converted, when I first decided to follow God and, and reaffirmed that at different stages in my life, there was this, this energy 
to do what he wanted me to do to make changes. In fact, that's probably the one thing that I saw that we didn't mention is that, and I know I'm running out of time, but I haven't heard a bell, so I feel like I'm okay. Um, but this, this energy we see early on in chapter 19. Next time I won't even mention there's a bell. In chapter 19, we find that all of these people in, uh, Perry talked about it last week, that Ephesus was this place of magic and sorcery. And, and all of these people started learning about God, learning about Jesus, becoming part of the way. And as a result, 50,000 silver coins worth of scrolls and incantations and magic stuff was burned. Not because Paul said, hey, get rid of that stuff. But because they had a passion for God and a zeal for Jesus, and they said, I don't need this. Stuff. That's, not, that's not what I need. And they got rid of it because it wasn't real. It wasn't true. I wonder if we need to look back and do that. This is what I'll leave you with. What's your job? Because it's not just the church. You have a place in this congregation. What is your job in making sure South Utah doesn't lose its Doesn't lose that first love? How do you help do that? I'll leave that with you to think on this week. And thank you so much for great participation. And we'll be back next week.